Maybe this box is something that just is always there for you in the forefront of your mind. Whenever you come to church, whenever you come into your friendships, this sits there. This is hindering you being truly open with God because you don't want to go there. You think if it gets all out, it's gonna be messy. It will be messy, but it's worth it in the long term. It's messy. But you can see Jesus more clearly. And then he can pick it through with you. Some of it he might turn around and throw it and say, well, that's nothing. I don't know why you've even hanging on to that. Because I'm not, that's why it's on the floor. Come and have a rummage with us. Associate Pastor Warren takes us on a narrative journey of a certain person who is ultimately carrying a big box. In all of the relationships they have, including the one with Jesus, they are hindered by the box. What's in your box? Lord, it is by you that we live and we breathe. It is by you that we actually have our very being. And we thank you. Lord, as was quite elegantly sung this morning, Lord, that you have broken our chains. And so we can live in freedom. Father, as, as we come to your word here and as uh, Sunday Club, the creche and the ask the youth, come into your word and look at you in all the various formats lord we pray for all of us that there this morning will be release <coughs> we will truly be changed and transformed as we walk out this morning in the name of jesus amen we're going to be looking at story that is probably well known to a lot of us it's in all three synoptic Gospels. That's the three. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke in various formats. Mark being the one who is commonly adhered to, has wrote the Gospel in the first place, and Matthew and Luke would have copied bits and stories out of there. Hence why there are some parallel stories, but with some slight differences. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. Normally titled in most Bibles as the rich young man or the rich young ruler, depending on which version you're looking at. But what I like about the Mark version, even though in our English translations, most of them will have it subtitled, the rich young man. You do realize, don't you, those subtitles weren't in the original text. Just thought I'd mention that. It's interpreters who've then interpreted for us, stuck them in there to help us. And occasionally, let's be honest, when we're searching frantically for a Bible story, it's useful, isn't it? Not knocking it at all. It is useful. But um, in the Mark version, the, even though it's been translated now in English to uh, a man ran up to him, actually, originally in the Greek, it was more of a, a certain person or the one or a one came up to Jesus. So this sort of very much allocating it to being a man is more born out of the fact that Matthew and Luke have decided to do that. Now, I'm not saying it's not male in the Greek, but actually I find it more helpful giving out incredibly gender inclusive lifestyle now that it could have meant anybody because I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly young, and I most certainly am not a ruler, and I most certainly am not rich. So sometimes you might read that story and go, well, that doesn't apply to me. And if you're a lady, you might tell myself, it doesn't apply to me because it's about a man. But actually, I like the Mark version. Actually, it was more 
generic, I'm hoping more general, and so actually can apply to all of us. Okay? So I'm going to hopefully use the term a person. Occasionally, if I slip into male, he terms, please forgive me, because I've been reading it advent in all the English translations, and it's constantly he. So are you with me? So this includes all of us, okay? With me so far? Excellent. Also, don't shut off and go, well, that doesn't, this story's not going to apply to me because we know the end of the story. Because we're, I'll be honest with you, we're going to swerve off after a while. Because this can apply in different ways, in different meanings. So if you don't believe yourself to be young, don't shut off. If you don't believe yourself to be rich, don't shut off. If you don't believe yourself to be a man, don't shut off. Just sit with the story. Let the spirit speak to you, okay? So, we'll start. I'm going to read all of it in one hit, and then we can carry on. As Jesus started on his way, sorry, Mark 10, verse 17. Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I'm going to leave it there for now. Just a few things to note. Verse 17. Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees. The running and kneeling. This person ran and knelt before Jesus. Denotes an eagerness to be with or an eagerness to be a disciple of Jesus. The whole running up and kneeling before him. I'm eager to be your disciple. I'm submitting myself to you and your teaching. I am eager. I want to be. This is what this person wanted to do. Run up and knelt. Can you say that for yourself? The eagerness was there. And he comes to Jesus with a magnificent question, as one of the commentators I read put it. He came to Jesus with a magnificent question. A question that up until this point, nobody, not even the, what we then turned into the apostles, not even the close disciples of Jesus, had even yet asked Jesus. In, in either of all the Gospels, not once was this question until this person came and asked it, was actually asked of Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's an amazing question. You sit and just sit on that question just for a moment. It's a question that I think is underlying for a lot of us. Not just Christians, I think the world generally on the whole. This sense of wanting to live forever in some format or another. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an amazing question to come and ask. What must I do? Now that's point I've got this imagination that this person really was hoping for an answer that they wanted to hear rather than the answer they needed there's a big difference so I love Jesus' response first and foremost he wants to deal with something else before that answering that question in verse 18 why do you call me good Jesus answered no one is good except God alone No one is good except God alone. 
No, I asked about how do I inherit eternal life. Why are you questioning the title that I've just given you, Rabbi? Rabbi meaning teacher. Why are you questioning that question? Well, why are you answering that? That's not what I asked. Jesus, at this point, in the story, with the way that Mark runs a theme through his books, through the book, is secrecy. Since that Jesus did not want to actually display that he was divine, he was God, there was a God nature to him. So, and a Messiah anointing on him. So he wants to keep that secret. So at this time, he doesn't want to display that. So he's going to hang on to the title teacher, which he is, but he wants to hang on to that. But he wants to sort of say, well, why are you calling me good? Because you only call God good. In Jewish time, you only call God good. Rabbis took lots of titles on. They didn't mind people calling them lots of things. But when it came to down being called good teacher, it's like only God is good. Now, the problem is, I think in English, the word good has lost a lot of meaning. Do you know, that's a good essay. I'm hoping that's what they'll say about my dissertation at the end. That will do me. It doesn't have to be magnificent and marvellous. Good, it will do enough. But the word good has sort of lost something in English translation. Here, God, good really meant Absolutely. You look at Genesis in the Genesis account. God looked and said it was good. And at the end of it, he said it was very good. It has strong meaning. So Jesus is quite rightly challenging those words. And he's saying, hang on a minute. I'm not good. Only God is good. Now we know the story. We know that Jesus is good. We know he's perfect. And we also know in one half of his nature, he is fully God. But at this point, he needs to keep that quiet. So he's not going to take on board any of those sort of titles. And he does the right thing that all disciples should do. He immediately points the person to God. And we need to do that. When people come up to us, our primary purpose ultimately is we want to point them to God and say it's all God. Yes? Okay. But there is a problem. And it's encouragement. Within the church family, we like to encourage each other, I hope. Somebody's done something really well, you want to say, do you know that's really good? But I don't know about you, I am a failing case of going, oh yeah, but it's all God. That's my immediate reaction. And I think some of us, we'd like to do that. We like to almost sort of, just, no, 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 don't point it to me, it's all God. And which is absolutely true, but it's okay to take encouragement. It's okay to go, thank you. Because the person wants to encourage you if you've done something in Jesus' name and you've done it well, because it means you've been listening to God, yes? And you'd like to know that you've been listening to God correctly if people are encouraging you, yes? So it's okay to go, thank you. But you know internally you're giving praise to God and, you know, and your fellow brother and sister know that you are giving praise to God. But you're taking encouragement. When it comes down to people that don't know Jesus yet, it's great to say thank you to them. They say, you know, you say, do you know something? It's actually my God that's done all of this through me. And it's a good witness after that. It's okay to take encouragement. You don't have to bat it away to the point of going, oh no, I must humble myself so much. It's okay to be humble. You can give it to the praise to God as well at the same time as taking some encouragement. Because it says in the Bible, spur each other on to love and good deeds. You only spur by encouraging. Oh, you can spur another way, but it won't be done out of love and for good reasons. I just thought I'd mention that. So Jesus' response was that clearly of a humble rabbi who recognizes the fact that only God is good. And then he's talking to this person and he recites some of the Ten Commandments. You know the commandments, he says. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Now, the do not defraud strictly is not a ten, one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, but what it is, is almost a, it's a good summary. It's a good summary of the spirit of the Ten Commandments. And defrauding would be recognizing here as defrauding the poor. Normally the rich in Jesus' time, and it ain't much different today, become rich because they've defrauded the poor. So I can understand the spirit of wrapping that up, hence why we can recognize that eventually this person is known as the rich man, ruler, 
whatever else. But it's that sort of wrapping it up in the spirit of it. And Jesus is making it quite clear. Well, you know what to do and what not to do. It's clearly here. Because the primary question of our person, if we remember this, is what do I do to inherit eternal life? And it's a little word I think we miss, do. We might skip over it. And it's actually quite significant. In the question, it's incredibly significant. So Jesus says here, so you know what not to do. So you know what to do by not doing this. Yes? This person, this certain person, by asking that question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? believes it is by doing something, by doing something that he needs to do to gain eternal life. It's a behavior pattern. I believe that he believes that, or sorry, that person believes actually should have to inherit eternal life. It's a way of being. I must do something to inherit eternal life. And as a good Jewish person here, which we gather this person is, is because of he's been, if they have been keeping the Ten Commandments for as long as they have, they're going to be doing it because they're a good Jewish person. They believe by keeping these commandments and by avoiding things they shouldn't be doing, they should be okay. But he's obviously not satisfied or else he wouldn't come and ask Jesus the question. Thinks it's by doing something. Can you imagine, can't you, he's kept them since he was a boy so this person has come up and gone I've been a good person today I've kept the ten commandments I've not murdered anyone I haven't committed adultery I've been a good boy or a good girl I turned up at church today I looked after my family today I cleaned the car today I smiled at everyone I dressed smartly for church today I've been going to church since I was a child. I'm part of a volunteer group at the church. Weekly, I'm there faithfully doing this, doing that. I do, 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 and I avoid, void, void. I did, I did, I did, and I do, and I do, and I do. I can see this being a worship song. I kid you not. I did, I do, I did, oh my Lord, I do it for you. I did it for you to do, to do, and you know, it's that tune, I know, but live with it. <laughs> oh, lie, Lord Jesus, I did it for you. I can see that happening. How bad that tune was that, love? Yeah, okay. <sighs> yeah, I won't be joining the worship choir in heaven, I can assure you. <laughs> But I can see that can become our worship song. Falling into the trap of believing that it is by doing that I've inherited eternal life. It is by doing that I'm in good in God's sight. By not doing, I'm avoiding things, I'm okay. I can see that being a worship song and this is what this person came up and says to Jesus I've been doing this since I was a child can you imagine he's at that point he's going I'm safe I'm safe I've been doing these things since I was a child sorted I followed the rules I followed what I believe was meant to happen. I am sorted. And then I love the way that Jesus turns this around. Verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus looked at the person and loved the person. It's very easy maybe to look at this character when he says, oh, all these things I do, knowing the end of the story, knowing he's meant to be rich. 
and we can say hypocrite. He's ticked all the right boxes on the face of it. On the face of it, he's ticked all the right boxes. But what I love here is that Jesus looked and loved. Because Jesus loved the person, saw his heart, and realized this person's missing the point. Because the word looked here, the Greek word, is a compounded meaning. It means to examine or scrutinize. So when it says here Jesus looked, it's really Jesus scrutinized. Jesus looked inside the person and saw all. Person, Jesus looked inside and saw everything. Examined the motives. Examined what this person does in their life. Examined everything. Was not deceived for one moment. Looked inside and loved. Now, just for a minute, I'm just going to say this, just for a minute. This was a rich person, which, according to some of the translations, they were. Their clothing they were wearing was clearly would denote a rich person, yes? It would have been beautiful. It would have been an Armani suit. It would have been gorgeous. So on the outside, because rich being wealthy was seen as a blessing from Yahweh, this person would have looked like, would have looked like they had it all sorted. But when Jesus scrutinizes and looks inside, he is not deceived. Imagine this person turning up with the Sunday morning smile. It's all sorted. Get it all done. No problem here. Jesus looks inside and scrutinizes, examines. And loves you. Please note those very few words. Jesus looked inside this person and loves. This didn't look inside and go, oh, sort this, 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 this. Um, you're not doing this and you did that and everything else. And then I'll love you. Very clear here. Jesus looked inside, scrutinized and loved. In the story. Full stop. If they did punctuation in the Greek, but full stop. Also, the word love here in the Greek is agape, which is a word we hear banded around a lot. But it is the highest form of love in the New Testament. You couldn't get a higher form of love than actually Jesus looked at you and agape you. That's it. And do you know what the more amazing thing is? In Mark, it's the only time that Mark uses that word agape in the whole of the gospel. Not once is it used anywhere else. It is only in that one and only time in the gospel it's used. It's not used about maybe Jesus uh, loving the world or God loving the world. It is actually used about this one certain person. After being scrutinized and examined and all the bits that sit inside... Still, Jesus agapes. Must have been something unique about that person, maybe. But seeing this is a gospel for today as well, it means there is something unique for all of us. We're all unique people. And yet when Jesus looks inside and scrutinizes, he loves you. Yes, you.
Yes, with all the bad things you've done this week, with all the things you think you've really traumatised yourself, all the thoughts you might have even had this morning while you've been worshipping about the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Strange that some of that was a bit nervous laughter, I reckon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he still scrutinises all of that and still loves you. Now, I'll be honest, it's something my brain cannot get around. My heart can't get around it. Why would Jesus want to look inside of me and go, still love you, Warren? Mind blower. But it's true. Whether you feel it's true or not, it's irrelevant. Factually, it's true. It's the highest form as well. It's agape. It's not slightly love you. It's not philo. It's not maybe slightly love you. It's I really love you. End of story. Wrapped up in a box. Why am I hanging on this verse? Because I think a lot of us don't get it. We walk out of here later and forget this moment. Have a bit of road rage. You think that's it. You've just lost God's love. Maybe I'm talking personally. There will be no raid rage today at all, because I'm not driving anywhere. So, <laughs> but when God looks inside, I don't really road rage. I'm, not now, anyway. I gave it up last week for Lent. Right, when... Oh, Easter's finished. Oh, fantastic. No. But when God scrutinizes you, he loves you. I want that to sink in. Allow the Spirit right now, let Him work that in your system, into your very DNA. That when He looks at you and scrutinizes everything about you, the good and the bad, He still loves you, even if the bad outweighs the good. Quite frankly, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's why Jesus had to come. So, quite frankly, to be honest with you, ultimately, no matter if you do things really good or really well, you're still going to fall short. That's why you need Jesus. When Jesus looks inside of you, he loves you. Now, this is kingdom reversing. I love this. Kingdom reversing. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and then says, one thing you lack. Not one thing you have that's wrong, but actually one thing you lack. You lack something. We know the end of the story, but it's actually a lacking. You think you have it all, but you lack something. Just a bit prior to this in Mark's gospel, uh, there's a story about the children who appear to have nothing, but Jesus quite happily declares they have everything. This person has kept, has done everything, does it all. Keeps the Ten Commandments. But Jesus is great, but you lack. You actually lack something. Doing is not good enough. Believe it or not. Doing, 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 or not doing, not doing, is not good enough. You lack because of it. Are you with me? More importantly, are you with the Spirit right now? Is he speaking? And this is where we're going to take a slight swerve. Jesus looked at him, loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. This is where we're going to swerve. We're going to swerve because we so easily then will shut off and go, okay, it's about selling everything I have. It's about giving everything away and giving it to the poor. I must become aesthetic in my living. I must have absolutely nothing. Minimalist living must now be my way. By the way, minimalist living happens to be the new rich person's game. I don't know if you've seen houses and grand designs and things like that. That seems to be the minimalist living, having less. I quite like the idea. It means I can dust the shelving a lot easier. 
But the new way, supposedly, is I must live aesthetic living. Well, Jesus didn't have a problem with people being wealthy. Look at Joseph of Arimathea and the tomb to which Jesus was laid in. Jesus didn't have a problem with rich people. He had a problem with what they did with their wealth and how they became rich. That was the problem. But I want us to swerve off from this story because it's not all about wealth. It's about carrying something with you that is your security. It is the thing that you wish to hold always onto. And actually, it could be a hindrance. Because this person, he came running up going, what do I need to do? And of course, he heard all the Ten Commandments and he thought, I'm sorted then. But for Jesus here, he looks, scrutinizes, loves, and says, but you're lacking something. You're holding on to something that is your security blanket. You're holding on something that keeps your identity where you think it should be, which in this particular person's case was their wealth. But I'm going to move away from that, okay? This question was put to this man and told what he should go and do. And I just want to say this for a minute because I need this to hold for us. Edwards, who I was reading, said, to the question, what must a person do to inherit life in the future? Jesus directs that person to the present. The person must do something now. So right now, if that's you questioning what must I do to gain something in the future, Jesus is saying to you now, do something now in the present. So as I speak, allow Jesus to speak to you. Because you might need to do something now this morning. Make a conscious decision, a conscious action to do something. You up for that? The person came with a question, what should I do to inherit? Jesus' response actually is, you're lacking something. What you're really lacking is a relationship with Jesus Christ. A full-on relationship. A complete relationship. This person's worship song was, I do, I do, I do. There's absolutely no substitute for a full-on relationship with Jesus Christ. It won't do anything. No good standing before Jesus in the judgment seat and going, I did this, 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 this. Yeah, but where was the relationship? That's for those of us that are not Christians yet. But for even us Christians, sometimes we have a hindrance to our relationship. And this is what's going on here. You lack something. Actually, what you lack with me, person who's come running up and kneeling before me, is you lack openness with me because you're hanging onto a security blanket. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because... Why did he go away sad? In the story, it's because he had great wealth. But we're invited to feast always with our Lord Jesus. You're welcome to come and have a meal with him. When you come to have meals with friends and people, you, you, you turn up, don't you? Yeah? You turn up, and you, you, you enjoy the openness of the conversation, and maybe you bring something, maybe you might bring a bottle with you. You feel you should bring something to the meal to share. Maybe to thank them for cooking anything. But we're invited here to bring something. But this person in the story had actually something he, he was hanging on to as his blanket. He felt he needed to bring it all the time. He went away sad. Went away sad. Because he had a great big box. Don't worry about the label. The label says nothing that's, that's relevant to the... But he has a great big box. Wealth for him was his box. So picture yourself. Now as the person in the story. yourself that there's Jesus right now inviting you to come and have dinner with him.
come sit at the table. I've cooked for you, says Jesus. We know that. He cooked breakfast in John. Come and have dinner. So you find yourself running up to him, eager to be his disciple, to come and sit at Jesus. So you run up and you come before him, don't you? You want dinner and you want to chat and you want to open us a conversation. But you're always carrying this box. This box. Jesus is sat here, but your box comes forward and you're sort of having a conversation around the back of it all the time. It's the avoiding conversation. This is your box. Oh, by the way, sorry, just to explain, the feasting table is imagery that's used in the Bible all the time about having the great big banquet once we actually get into eternal life. So if you think I'm crossing my analogies, I am not. The question is, how do I inherit eternal life? If we're honest, every one of us as Christians probably at some point on our journey actually asked that question. That's probably why we came. We either were fearful of hell or we wanted eternal life. And we think it's about having to do something. It's not. Relationship with Jesus is not about doing. Gaining eternal life is not about ticking all the right boxes. It's about the relationship. I... A few weeks ago, and if you're here, please apologize. I'm not going to say names. I had a conversation uh, with a member of this church who um, felt they really had screamed and shouted at God a lot. And is that okay? And I said, good. Why? I said, because it's an open, honest relationship. And that's what Jesus wants. It's an open and honest relationship. But some of us turn up with our boxes. What does your box represent for you? Is it the neatly packed life? It's neat. It's okay. This is neat. Look, there's no rough edges. Nobody's going to see anything bad about me because it's neatly contained. But you're also trapped. You're trapped because you're so fearful of losing face, of dropping in people's eyes, you forget you don't need to worry about that. Is your box past hurts? that have been dealt with, but you're hanging on to them. And every time you come to the feast at the table with Jesus, every day, you bring that with you. Is it current hurts? Current pains that you've not gone and dealt with with someone? Or dealt with with God? And you keep bringing that all the time. You don't want to deal with it. You want to keep it there in the box, but it's in front of you and Jesus. Is it a past sin? Something you did years ago that you have long been forgiven for, but somehow you are hanging on to it like a security blanket. If I hang on to this, then therefore then I will feel like I'm being humbled. It's a past sin that God has well truly got rid of. He's forgotten about it. He's literally moved it as far as the east is from the west. Yet you're the one who hangs on to it. You won't forgive yourself. You won't forgive yourself. Why? Apostle Paul makes it quite clear. He doesn't judge himself. He has a clear conscience. Because of what Christ did. If Christ has forgiven him, how dare he hang on to his own guilt? And if that is you, please, I implore you, listen to this good analogy. If you're hanging on to your own sin and you're thinking, I can't forgive myself, yet God forgives you, you're putting yourself above God. Because if the creator and sustainer of this universe can forgive you, how dare you not forgive yourself? It's okay, God, you can forgive me, but I won't forgive myself. Huh? You ain't God, he is. I'm getting higher. But being serious... Forgive yourself. Stop bringing this box to this table to where forgiveness has always been.
Maybe it's a current sin. You know something that's sitting rooted in your life at the moment. You can't seem to shake. It's a repeated one. It's one that just keeps rearing its head. Yet for some reason, you really don't want to look at it and you don't want to tackle it. So you bring it, neatly packed, stick it in front of the table, and you work round it where Jesus goes, can we look at this? No, 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 no seriously. I've scrutinised you. I love you. I just want to look at this with you. Let me help you deal with this. But you don't want to. It's your box. Please remember these words. He scrutinises you and loves you. There's no sort of caveat in there. So if somebody loves you, even though they know the very worst about you, it means that they're willing to look at this with you with love. I list this stuff that I believe that God wants me to mention, so I'm just going to say them. This is not done of any secret knowledge of knowing anything about anyone. That worries you about the next thing I'll say now. Maybe you have an unmade confession that you need to make to people who are affected, affected family members, immediately affected people. Hear me very carefully. It's very easy to sit with some unmade confession and think we have to tell the whole world and it's populate, I was going to say world and it's whole world and its population about it. No, you do not. It's only those who are immediately affected by it. Something maybe you've done at some point in your life and you're hanging on to it and you really need, and it actually is there in the mix of all your relationships all the time. It affects the back of your mind. When you're in conversation, you almost shut some conversation down after a while because it's leading down that place you don't want it to go to because you did something wrong at some point. Maybe you've got an unmade confession you need to talk to family and friends about, but you're so scared to let it out. So not only does it affect your immediate relationships, it also affects your relationship with Jesus because it's not an area you want to go to. Because you don't want to lose face. You think the pain is going to be far too much. I would suggest the pain of keeping it boxed is going to be far too much. Maybe it is misuse of, misuse of wealth. Maybe your box is your status. Not just high status in society. There's this view that it's um, those who take pride in their status are those that are people who are high in society take pride in their status. Funnily enough, there are people who, so, who according to society, are low in status, but those people also take pride in their, that status as well. Maybe that's your box. Maybe you've got too much pride about your status or where you're at. Maybe you have pride in your nationality. Pride in your job title. You bring this all the time to your relationship with Jesus. This is your first and foremost nationa- pride. Is your nationality your job title? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. First and foremost, you're a child of mine. Let's get this box off the table. Let's keep the relationship going. Let's stop working around this, shall we? Maybe in your box is all the stuff that you don't want people to see. Maybe in the box is the stuff that you project onto others and onto God. Now, I'll come back to this statement again before I do anything else. Jesus scrutinizes us and loves us. Because Jesus doesn't want to be working around a box with you. He wants to get it sorted. Show it, reveal it, and sort it. Then the relationship can move forward. You can move forward. Because this box, as much as you think it's okay, actually is chaining you down. It's interesting for me that we were singing that song about chains. My chains have been ripped off, and it's true. But we allow certain things to hang on to us. What does the box represent for you today? Maybe this box is something that just 
is always there for you in the forefront of your mind. Whenever you come to church, whenever you come into your friendships, this sits there. This is hindering you being truly open with God because you don't want to go there. You think if it gets all out, it's going to be messy. It will be messy, but it's worth it in the long term. It's messy, but you can see Jesus more clearly. And then he can pick it through with you. Some of it he might turn around and throw it and say, well, that's nothing. I don't know why you've even hanging on to that. Because I'm not. That's why it's on the floor. And then he'll pick it through with you after one. And go, yep, done that one. Really? This one you need to go and sort with someone relationally first. And then bring it back to me. And then we'll sort it. And then eventually, you will have sorted it all, slowly but surely, over time. Stenzel quite rightly said, some things with God take time. It doesn't all happen in an instant. We live in a lovely instant society. Unfortunately, it does take time, especially if the damage has been long term. It's going to take long term to get to a place where it's fully restored. But you can then come up to this table all the time, can't you? And enjoy it. And go, I'm with Jesus. There's nothing. Oh, what? there's nothing. <laughs> but there's nothing. I know you laugh, but that's where you want to be, isn't it? Totally and utterly free. You don't want to be carrying this box around with you that you always put in front of you and Jesus and you in front of your fellow brothers and sisters. Or you and your family. You and your friends. Because you think they're going to look at you less. And they might well do, but that's their problem, not yours. Jesus scrutinizes you and loves you. And he's the one who gives you eternal life. There should be an amen at that point. This morning is not the morning to walk away sad. This morning is this morning to go, yeah, now is the time to look at it. Now is the time to deal. As Edwards put, to the question, what must a person do to inherit life in the future? Jesus directs that person to the present. That person must do something now. Their full adherence, and this is me, to their worship song of I do, I do, is no substitute for a relationship with Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Talk to our Lord now. There's a very strong possibility that God has spoken to some people this morning about about them and their relationship with him it might be that your worship song is I do, I do, I did, I did, I did and you've forgotten the relationship side of life Jesus says lose that worship song come to me, let's have a relationship the doing comes out of the relationship but we've got it flipped round the other way Yes, baptism. Or well, maybe there's just something in your life, a box, that you know that Jesus has been identifying for some time. And you need to do something now, in the present, about it. Sometimes we have to actually physically move. It helps. Just sitting quietly in the corner, we don't always give everything up. I invite you all to stand. 
People are not going to come and individually pray for you. People are not going to come and individually pray for you. But if you want to make a response, whatever that is, to God, I invite you, come forward, give it up here, the mess, whatever it is, give it up here to this table. Give it up here, just come and just rest before God for a while and just say, yeah, I want to sort this. So can I invite you to stand? Everybody will keep their eyes shut. As I said to you, don't worry about what everybody else thinks. It's Jesus who scrutinizes and loves. That's you. And you want to just come and make yourself available. The cameras do not record this moment at all. If you want to just come and kneel before God, then now is the time. Father, I thank you for this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, because you scrutinize us and love us. As much as we just can't get our heads around that, I thank you. I pray for all of these people who have come forward, literally giving something up to you, giving up whatever their boxes are, Father, I want to pray that you will do what I know you'll do and you'll honour that. You'll work at that with them. You work it through with them. And Lord, put people around them that will help them work that through as well. For their brothers and sisters that will help them. Lord, by your spirit, I ask you to wash out upon these people now. Where maybe minds need to be transformed. Lord, I pray by your spirit, you will start transforming them. It will become a fixed asset in their heads that they know that you love them and there is nothing else they need to worry about. Lord, where they've hung on to boxes, maybe hurts and pains or just whatever their box is, Lord, that you will now work in that. Open them up, deal with the mess at their feasting table. They will get a release. They will know that the chain has been broken this morning. They have been released. They can run free. Feels like a sense of come like a rushing wind upon people, Lord. As they walk out of this building, they know they're walking into your freedom. And I pray for all of us, Lord all of us that you will help us to walk freely with you in the name of Jesus Amen We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv Dot TV.